I tell you that is, my mic is back on, so that's good. So welcome, folks, and um, thanks for um, being interested in numeracy. Uh, um, my passion. Um, so my background, a little bit about me. Um, I, you know, I started my career as a secondary school, high school maths teacher here in Victoria, and um, and then uh, I actually went and talked in England for about eighteen months. And when I came back to Victoria, uh, I couldn't get a job back in a high school. Must have been one of the only very rare times when. Uh, there was a surplus of maths teachers in Victoria. So when I left Australia, the acronym TAFE didn't exist. When I came back, there were these jobs being advertised in these TAFE colleges. So I rang the union and said, what are these TAFE colleges? And uh, people in the union said, oh, they're just glorified tech schools and you'll be employed through the education department anyway. So I applied for a job in a TAFE. And so that was the start of my journey into working with adults and discovering the world of adult literacy and numeracy. And it changed my whole perspective on mathematics and how you teach mathematics and the importance of mathematics. Um, and probably the only reason I'm here today is because of that serendipitous event that uh, ended up seeing me working with adults. And uh, and since then, I've sort of worked in the adult literacy and numeracy field across Australia and and uh, got my fingers in many pies, um, writing teacher training materials um, and uh, Writing the Australian Core Skills Framework, I write Victorian curriculum, uh, both uh, post-secondary school age kids um, and work on international surveys and stuff. And I guess what I want to share with you today is I guess that bit about that journey that I've taken over since the late 1970s last year and what I've learned about how important numeracy is and how critical it, critical it is. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, some of what I share is what I've learned from not just from I'll share start by sharing some of the things that I've learned from my teaching days, but also talk about some of the things I've learned from some of the international work that I do. So what am I going to talk about? I'll talk a little bit about what's maths and numeracy. I'll talk a fair bit about numeracy at work. Um, was privileged to have probably worked in 12, 13, 14 different industries um, as a sort of numeracy consultant and that taught me a lot. Talk a little bit about the difference between maths and numeracy and, and how it connects with la literacy and language. Uh, as I said, I'll talk, share with you some of the things I learned from my students and then I'll go on and thump the table a bit about what research and data there is that uh, shows why maths and numeracy is pretty critical in the 21st century and, one, and some of the challenges that we face in Australia. Um, and then towards the end, I'll get on and hopefully share with you a few tips and ideas about how I think uh, numeracy is best taught. Throughout, I'll give you the chance to ask questions or please use the chat um, throughout the session. So um, one of the things I do do is I collect cartoons. So um, there's a cartoon to get you going. Um, so, you know, I guess I believe that numeracy is pretty important because if you get the decimal point in the wrong place, the consequences can be pretty significant. Um, and there was a case that I share and talk about quite a lot and it can be um, important for people in their lives and uh, and in 2017 there was actually a, a case in Scotland where a couple of uni students put up their hands to uh, uh, participate in uh, you know one of those sort of trials and I'm probably they were given a $50 voucher or something to participate but uh, the person who was mixing up so they were the study was to analyze what the effect of um, caffeine was on your body and they were given or administered caffeine and as you can see in the last paragraph it was mixed with um, uh, fruit juice or something or other and they got the decimal point two places out so instead of being given 0.3 of a gram of caffeine these two students were given 30 grams um, and apparently 15 grams is enough to kill you so they ended up being in intensive care within hours of taking 100 times the amount of caffeine that they were supposed to have. Um, so to me, that's, you know, an instance of where, you know, numeracy has um, been pretty critical for those people's lives and um, they're permanently damaged because of that, getting the decimal point two places out. And it's not just the calculation that they said they did on their mobile phone, um, but it's actually knowing what 0.3 of a grams of something looks like compared to 30 grams. There's be quite a big difference between the, of the volume and the amount 
of that powder. So it isn't just about getting the arithmetic right, it's also having a sense about how much something looks like. And I have some colleagues in the UK have done a lot of work with nurses and their argument for that research with nurses is that there's the two aspects to medication and dosages. It is knowing about getting the arithmetic and using the formulae or whatever it is, but it's also making sure that people have a sense of, you know, what something's supposed to look like or how much it, volume it is and so on. So a little bit about yourself. So look, I've got four categories there. You, you, um, you may be in other categories. So what, I'll just go through them and if you can raise your hand using the raise your hand button. Um, how many people would say and you can put your hand up for more than one. So um, can you put your hand up if you consider yourself to be a vet teacher trainer? As in press the button for at the top of your screen for putting your hand up. I want to see some hands up. Uh, yeah, quite a few. All right. So how many are in the next category? How many would also consider themselves or separately consider themselves to be a literacy or language teacher and trainer? Yep, most of lots of you. So you're obviously multi-talented mob. And what about how many of you would say that you are also a numeracy teacher and trainer? Put your hands down if you if you aren't. So you're all saying you're in numeracy. Oh wow, this is really good. And how many interested others? Have we got anybody who's a little bit, you know, odd, doesn't fit in to some of those other categories? Have we got somebody who's an odd person? Can you tell one of the people who's got their hands up now? Do you want to unmute yourself and tell us who you are and why you're interested in numeracy, but you're not one of the first three? Anybody brave enough? Kirsten, Carmela, still got your hands up. No, all right, okay, let's continue. Now the other thing, um, we want to know where you've come from. Um, so hands up if you're from the ACT. We got anybody from the ACT? Hands down if you've still got your hands up from the previous question. Maybe it looks like we've got a couple. Yep. How many from what's the next state? New South Wales. How many from New South Wales have we got? Yeah, it looks like a good, good lot from New South Wales. Fantastic. And how many? Anybody from the Northern Territory? Kirsten, looks like it. Cool. Glad you could make it. Queensland, the warmer state when it's not raining. A few people from Queensland. Any more? Gordon, welcome. South Australia. I was going to be taking my mum to South Australia next week, but us Victorians are still banned, so I can't take my mum. My mum's a Natalian. I have lots of cousins over in South Australia, but not sure when I'm going to be able to get there. So Victoria's nearly out of its lockdown, but um, can't get in South Australia yet. Maybe some from South Australia. How many Tazies? I think Billy said there are a few from Taz Tafe. Hands up if you're from Tassie. Yep, quite a few. A few years since I was down in Tessie, but I was doing a bit of work about four or five years ago down there. And good old Victoria. I don't think we've got many Victorians. Victorians are slack buggers. One. <laughs> One. Yep, we have one. Two. Welcome, Siobhan. I hear you're an old Aspire person. Welcome. Uh, and good old WA. I know we've got some WA people. My friends from Corrections WA. Yes, welcome, folks. That's good. Say hi to Jane whenever you um, see her. OK, thanks, folks. That's really good to get such a, a varied group um, here to listen to numeracy, me talk about numeracy. So what is numeracy? I mean, to me, 
<coughs> you know, numeracy is just everywhere. I, I don't care where I look. Um, I, and I see numeracy, whether it's shopping, you know, footy, sport, navigating, getting around, drinking, you, you name it, there's numeracy everywhere. Um, and with the pandemic, you know, we can't, these are taken from this morning, you know, we are bombarded in this, uh, the last year or so with graphs, data, charts, what's 1.5 metres, all that stuff then in where our house, other house is where we spent a fair bit of time is in the rural area and one of the little towns called Tura, um, on its welcoming sign outside the town, there's this um, lovely photo and, a, and an image that says 1.5 metres equals the length of a cow, you know, so, <laughs> so a really nice, uh, and if you go to the zoo, which I do with some of my grandkids, uh, there's things about, you know, the length of this or so many of these animals is the 1.5 metres. So people have been quite inventive about what 1.5 metres is. So, you know, so certainly there's been a hell of a lot of numeracy in the last year or so. And I always say there's some particular topics, depending on who your cohort is you're teaching. I always say you could teach the whole Australian curriculum if you are working with 16, 17 year old boys around cars and girls. Um, and that there's so much maths involved in cars. Um, and uh, as you'll see, the last couple of things that come up are speedos. And I was actually in doing some work in Taz TAFE, probably five or six with Taz TAFE teachers five or six years ago, and there was an auto guy there. And he said, and I raised the issue of my, at that point in time, my new Subaru Forester. Um, one of the first times we were driving it, I said to my partner who was driving, I said, oh, how much petrol's left? And she looked at this, um, the petrol gauge and she said, oh, shit, I don't know. It's in sixths. So that the number of number of gradations in the Subaru that we did have, I think, was six. So so it was you know much more complicated. She couldn't just say a quarter or a half or full or whatever she had say. So I think she said, oh, there's four marks left or something. Right? There's four marks left. So but this guy said he has a collection of I think he said something like 14 or 15 different images of fuel tank gauges which have different sized fractions on them. So if ever you want to teach fractions, Go and take some photos or find some images of petrol gauges and you'll cover a broad spectrum of um, fractions that are used in calculating how much fuels in a in a tank. So there's a, a good example because I often say that uh, the best examples for using fractions in the real world is often uh, cooking. Cooking recipes still use fractions of cups and stuff. But uh, um, after that discussion with that guy and my partner, Jan, when we were driving the new Subaru, um, petrol gauges is also a good instance of where you can use fractions. And again, as I said earlier, I've been really privileged to, um, you know, visit and work in a range of um, industry based programs over the years that in Australia used to have this amazing program called WELL, the Workplace English Language and Literacy Program for years and years and years, which funded a lot of work in workplaces. And I've worked on, you know, 12 or 13 over the years, but um, that's died. There's some small ones under the new skills for the future, but nothing like the substantial amount of funding and support that was given under WELL. So again, if you work, walk into workplaces, I just think you're often bombarded with numeracy and mathematics. Um, now here's a couple of examples. One of my early forays into working um, was at uh, um, a small goods um, um, manufacturing industry here in Melbourne. And this, I still eat ham and salami, even though I've been in and seen how they make it. Um, and uh, so this was one of the standard operating procedures uh, for making, I think it says at the top roast beef. Um, I remember one of the, mo the most amazing stories, uh, one of my visits to uh, this small goods factory was that uh, I went in on a, one of the meetings under the WELL program was with a group of staff and they were analysing some, some data and uh, somebody was really excited because they were using, learning to use Excel and they were showing the, sharing the Excel spreadsheet up on the, I think it was an old overhead projector in those days and uh, had all this data and I said, oh, what's the data about? And they said, oh, it's the bits of metal. I said, what do you mean the bits of metal? And uh, so they explained that under each of the huge 
mincing machines that they had, which were sort of like a couple of meters long and, you know, maybe 400, 500 um, millimeters wide, you know, quite big long things with these big grinders that mashed everything up together. Um, of course, bits of metal fall off the grinder or, and so they have these big mag magnets underneath that make the metal, we hope, <laughs> make the metal adhere to the bottom of the, of the grinder. And so then they, at the end of each shift, they would clean it and count how many bits of metal were in each of the, of these things. So this was the, the number of bits of metal that they'd found in all of the, the grinders that were in the in the facility and I thought oh god um, but I'd still do eat ham and salami I, I I do like it but you can see on this instruction the this we this was a project where we just looked at measurement um and you can see there that uh you know there's temperature weight there's linear dimensions and time is used all in these instructions in order for this process worker to actually help manufacture and make um, um, cold meat. So to me, there's maths embedded in all of these sorts of activities. Uh, this was um, a colleague who uh, was actually getting her kitchen redesigned while we were doing this project. So the sketch on the left is uh, this, the worker was happy for us to use his materials. So the one on the left is the sketch that he made on the job in um, Tina's kitchen. And then the one on the right is then when he went back to the office and he had to draw it up and make it all look, you know, official so that they could start doing some actual quotes and work out what was needed. So again, you know, that's space and shape and, you know, measurements and so on involved in that. So in, you know, and one of the industries why they, um, the uh, steamrollers there is because one of the industries I worked in was in asphalting. Um, I worked in plastics industry, different food industries, some engineering um, works. Um, and so in all of them, I was, I guess, as a maths teacher who sort of often thought, well, do people actually ever use their math skills in real life? Um, I was gobsmacked by how much maths was actually used in the workplace. And the thing that amazed me the most, I guess, was that there were very few industries where measurement wasn't used. Um, and so, and I don't think measurement's one of the things we teach kids very well in schools. So therefore it's something that I think we probably need to do a better of when we're actually working with our students and our learners in, in VET because measurement will often be a skill that's critical, but may not, the students may not be very good at it, not in terms of practical sort of skills. And of course, numbers in all forms, lots of quantities, know, dollars per cubic meter and so on, ratios, Statistics, tables, graphs, averages with, um, you know, occupational health and safety and quality control. Often there's a lot of stats and data collected. Need to know about shapes, plans, diagrams, location and direction. And the other thing that amazed me was that, yes, um, um, people out in the real world in ordinary old jobs actually have to use algebra and formulae. And I'll show you a couple. In the asphalting, um, the um, Calx unit that I um, helped them develop and write. Um, this was for um, laying asphalt and from a truck. Um, when they drive the truck down the road with the sprayers at the back and the asphalt comes out before they put the aggregate over the top, I just assumed naively as an observer in the previous to doing this work that they just hopped in the truck and drove it down the road. Well, no, before they hop in that truck, they have to do about I don't know, a dozen calculations um, because it depends on the sprayers at the back, how far apart they are, how much they give out, how hot the bitumen is in the truck and all that sort of stuff. And these are some, there's, you can see in this example of one of the calculations, there were four steps and each of those four steps actually had a formula in it. And they hate math so much that therefore they actually avoid using what I call a, you know, a pronumeral in mathematics. So they write it out in words, which from me, from a maths perspective, just makes it more horrific than if they actually used algebra, because one of the values of algebra is it makes things look more simple. Um, so, and, you know, people being rude about us maths people already and saying that we're odd. Um, that's quite relevant to something I'll talk about later. So, you know, so so even for something like this, it was quite complicated. And for some other international work I was doing recently, I came across very similar mathematics and use of formulae. And this is from an Australian resource and it's about spraying agricultural 
um, you know, farmer spraying chemicals out of, again, sprayers on the back of their vehicles. And so the similarity and obviously the mathematics and the calculations are very similar because it's related to sprayers. But again, this was just something that I found quite easily. Um, and again, it's something that people in order to get the chemical and the and the amounts right um, have to do a hell of a lot of mathematics. In terms of ACSF levels, this is up at ACSF level five. So there's a hell of a lot of mass out there that's used in the workplaces, and that can vary from relatively low level stuff to quite sophisticated understanding and use of formulae. So what I discovered, I guess, in these years of working in industry was that mass was used, but it was really messy. Um, it wasn't like we saw in a mass school textbook. It was often embedded within the context um, and you had to actually be able to work with your students, with the learners, with the workers to get them to recognise and be able to look and find out what the maths was and be able to then know what to do and how to do it. Um, you certainly needed to be able to talk about mathematics and communicate it. Um, and one of the issues that I, I had many arguments with was as a maths educator, I, I often would with my students would say, oh yeah, that's about okay, you know, that if they were a little bit out, you know, that's all right. They got, they understood the maths and, you know, I was relatively happy. But of course, when you're actually in industry, you can't be about right. You actually need accuracy and you need to understand things like tolerances. And that's something that, again, I don't think we taught very well or do teach very well in school. Um, and the terminology in the language was often really critical. Um, and so, you know, so I was teaching what I called normal adult literacy and numeracy classes um, in different providers here in Victoria. So I taught in TAFE, but I taught in a couple of um, community providers as well. I uh, did a, quite a lot of team teaching with literacy and ESL people. Um, so one of the common things about most of my students um, um, was that, you know, the common element is that a lot of people don't think they're very good at maths. And so if you're going to address this numeracy issue, one of the things you need to look at is really about um, how people feel about mathematics. And often you've got to make them feel a bit uh, less stressed by actually having to do some mathematics. Um, the other thing that I was surprised about is that people had gaps in their knowledge. They weren't always completely hopeless at maths across all of maths. Um, they'd know some things and not other things. Uh, and so it was about sometimes you having to make as the teacher or as the tutor, trying to make connections between the things they did know and could do with the things that they didn't know and can do. Um, and a lot of adults actually know that they need to know mathematics um, and, uh, uh, and that therefore they weren't like kids who say, when am I ever going to use this maths? Because in a sense, they knew that they needed to know maths. Um, and so what was important was actually to teach them how the maths work and how it connected to the real world. Um, I guess the other critical thing that I found was that um, all my adult students uh, would express to me and tell me as a maths person that I didn't, they didn't see mathematics in the same way that I did. And so I remember you know, one of my first instances when somebody um, asked me about, well, why do you turn the fraction upside down and multiply it when you divide fractions? And my initial answer was, well, you do it because it works, you know, um, because as a maths person, um, it made sense to me. Um, and then I realised, but maybe for 75% of my kids when I was teaching year seven and eight, um, when I was teaching them this stuff, that probably 75% of the kids didn't have a clue why it worked. Um, and I probably just taught it to them as an algorithm, as a rule, and actually didn't go about teaching them from scratch, if you like. Now it's really quite, well, it's not easy, but you can actually teach it by just talk about pizzas, apples and things. And, you know, um, if so many people are eating, if they each eat half a pizza and you've got have six pizzas, how many people can you feed? You can do it from a real world context and then you can get to the point where you can say, OK, so how do we write this in a mathematical way and how can we see it in a mathematical way? And then you realise that you can get the answer by turning the fraction upside down and multiplying. But you get to that at the end, you work it out first from a real life expl um, explanation. Um, 
so one of the things you know that I found is that I had to learn how to teach basic mathematics um, and through often teaching students why the method that they learned uh, was wrong and then teach them the right way that I had to learn. I'd never seen or used um, one of those base 10 sets of blocks. I had to go out and buy a set um, and learn how to teach them, even though I was a trained maths teacher. Uh, I was assumed that when I taught secondary school level maths, I didn't have to worry about things like place value and teaching place value, but it's really critical. So I soon learned that you had to use hands on visual stuff. I mean, the other thing that you often find is that students um, you know, uh, once you explain something to you, you, they say, oh, is that all it was? You've sort of unlocked the key to the door that's been a stumbling block to them for a long time. And sometimes it's really simple things and simple conversations uh, that allows that to happen. So talk to students, get them to tell you what their problems are. I mean, one example was with uh, a student who was came to my TAFE maths class because she was enrolling in a course at uni which involved psychology and she knew she had to do, you know, stats and stuff and understand hypothesis testing and things like that. And uh, um, so we were doing and she was learning how to use, do standard deviations and a whole range of relatively sophisticated maths and statistics. And um, she was doing all these calculations with quite, you know, you know, small as in decimal numbers and a lot of the answers of that. And she was, she'd done some work and I was talking to her about it and she said, she said something like, oh, this answer can't be right. And I said, what do you mean it can't be right? Because it was right. Um, I said, but it's fine. She said, but it can't be right. I said, but I don't understand why, because it is right. And she said, well, I've just multiplied this by that. And the answer is smaller than the numbers I started with. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? She said, but when you multiply, you must end up with a bigger number. And uh, I said, but what are those two numbers that you multiplied? So I went through um, the fact that one of the numbers she was multiplying by was a naught point number, which then she was able to tell me was a fraction and that that fraction was less than one. And when you talked about fractions and what a fraction of something was, then she understood that you could get a fraction less than one off multiplied by something else gave you a smaller number, not a bigger number. But one of her concepts that in, was in her head was that when you multiplied, you always got a bigger number, which is sort of from whole numbers and when we often learn multiplication. And so once I told her that sometimes when you multiply, you can get a smaller number than you started with, she said, aha, uh -huh, OK, now I understand. But sometimes adult students will have carried that misunderstanding for a long, long period of time. And sometimes you have to actually have that discussion with them. And sometimes it's a five minute discussion and then they're fine and they can proceed and go ahead. And the other thing that really astounded me about adult students um, from sort of 17, 18 year olds upwards was how much maths they could learn once they were motivated and engaged and had a purpose. And that sometimes I would have these students in my classes who I thought, my goodness, they've really just done the year seven to 10 curriculum in three hours a week over six months because they were motivated and they, and maybe they were taught, being taught maths in a, um, you know, in a different way than they had when they were at school. So I want to share with you a couple of sort of anecdotes. Um, I became became very obsessed with the connection of language and words because of what a lot of my students have um, did and explained to me. So there was um, a long, and because I've sort of been involved in a bit of research, um, so this is based on a big longitudinal study that was undertaken in the UK. So you, you may have seen this, but this is the actually where this was quoted. So the, these kids in secondary schools had to sit a test and then the, a lot of those students were then interviewed. And so one of the questions uh, on the test was work out the volume of a rectangular prism or a box. Um, and this kid um, didn't get it right. So he was interviewed and the interviewer said, do you know what volume means? And the kid says, yes. Uh, well, could you tell me what it was? And the kid says, yes, it's what's on the knob on the TV set. Um, so here's this, you know, kid trying to calculate the volume of this shape that maybe in back in the 1980s when this um, research was done looked like the old fashioned TV sets. But this this child was sort of thinking that using V equals L times W times H somehow was the same as 
turning the knob on the TV set. So unless we actually have that conversation with our students about how, what the words mean and how we use them in mathematics um, is, is really, they could be sitting there not understanding what it is when you're talking about volume when they've got um, this other concept of volume. And there's four numbers for you. Um, so what's what's something that's common about those four numbers, mathematical that's common? Put it in the chat. And the words already appeared in somebody else's comments. So what's something common about those four numbers? Yep, Sharon's got it, they're all odd. Um, so those are, I mean, you could say they're all less than 34, you know, there's other things, but one of the common mathematical aspects of those four numbers is that they're all odd numbers. And, you know, I now wonder how many of my kids when I was teaching them and I just assumed that all my students knew what an odd and even number was, but maybe a lot of them were thinking, well, I don't know, how, how am I supposed to know whether 21's odd? Because I've never met odd, I've never met 21, I don't know what they're like, are they strange like Dave is, you know. So, so when you actually think about how we use maths words in a maths classroom with how we might use those maths words outside the classroom, they're often, they could be connected, but often they're not connected. And then unless our students know how, once they're in this maths world, what those words mean, then there can be this confusion and misunderstanding happens. So, so one of the things that I often talk about is that make sure you have these discussions with your students about any of the math words that you're you're actually going to be talking about and working with, um, in case uh, there is that misunderstanding that they've had. So I want to share with you um, a couple of only a couple. Um, I, um, when I run longer workshops just about language and maths, um, I have lots of other anecdotes um, from my students. So can you type into the chat, what's the error that has been made by the learner here to get 667 when they add 347 to 32? Yeah, so they've they've added up from the left hand side, which relates to place value. Um, so they've added the the hundreds to the tens, and then the tens to the tens, and then the sevens is just sort of on the end. So that is, if there's anything that's critical in numeracy, if students don't know about how numbers work in place value, then they're pretty stuffed. Um, and uh, and so I, that's when I went out and bought those um, base ten. MAB blocks um, and carried them with me to my classes. And often a lot of my colleagues would say, you mean you take blocks into your adult numeracy class? And I said, I sure do. Because it was, and I'd never seen them. I'd never used them in all my training as a secondary school maths teacher. I'd never seen MAB blocks until I started to teach adult numeracy students. Because it was one of those things when you actually showed students that you could represent numbers physically um, with these blocks the reason why we have all these algorithms and the way we do sums the way we do them is because that makes sense mathematically and the blocks actually show you why you do decomposition in subtraction. So I would always use them to explain why we do things the way we do them in mathematics. So place value is really, really critical and it's something that we need to make sure our students understand. Sometimes the blocks would only come out for 10 minutes, that's all, because it's one of those aha moments where students simply say, ah, oh, is, that, is that how it works? That's why it works that way. Money used to be really useful, but one of the things about getting rid of one cent coins is that you don't can't actually imitate um, uh, the number system as well because of not having one cent coins anymore. Here's another one. So, have a look at 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 equals 2 over 6. What did they do here?
Yep, so you're all, I like all your mathematical understanding. So they've added the top numbers and the bottom numbers. They haven't um, actually found a com lowest common denominator, have they? So um, what you're all thinking is that uh, 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 equals 3 over 4, yep, um, by finding co lowest common denominator. So sure, that's correct, but so is that. Uh, so they're both actually true statements. Um, so, you know, so those scrawls on the page um, are representations of something. Uh, and both of those statements, mathematical statements, are actually fully correct. And maths teachers are really good at doing the second one. Can anybody know of an instance in the context where 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 equals 2 out of 6? Maybe put your hand up if you know when that's actually done. And there's actually a third one in biology. Yeah, Tim must have heard me before. There's a third one which is related to genetics where 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 actually equals 3, 3 out of 8. Um, so, so what happens is that um, the first one is the 1 over 2 means 1 half and the uh, 1 over 4 means a quarter. So if you add a half and a quarter, you do get three quarters when they're representing those fractions. But um, as Tim said, if it's a mark on a test, then the first question was worth two marks and you got one mark out of two. And then the second question on the test was worth four marks and you got one mark out of four. Then what you end up as your final mark is two marks out of six. So that is a legitimate way of writing that some of those marks on different aspects of a test. So so, so that what I always say, the scrolls on the page represent something um, and it depends on what they're representing as to what the answer is. And so to me, one of the really critical things is that it's the context that makes, gives it meaning and sums and numbers by themselves don't. Um, so I think it's a, a critical thing that we often, and people often say that, you know, maths is, always, you know, it's this given uh, there can't be two answers answers to the, the one question. Well, in fact, they can. Um, and so it's really critical that sums are important if you know what those numbers, those scrawls on the page are representing. Um, so to me, the context gives meaning. And, you know, I always argue, start with the context. You're all working in vocational education training, so you'll have examples or bring them from people's lives um, and use, get the mathematics out of the context um, so that there's meaning and then you can have the discussions about what they actually mean. And I think one of the problems is that, um, if you read that cartoon first. Excuse me, Dave. Yep. Just, just reminding you of the time. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you very much. No worries. Halfway through. Um, so that, you know, cartoon is, you know, a relatively famous one, I think, um, but, you know, that uh, I guess one of the things that I, reflecting on how I used to teach, I don't think I was a bad secondary school maths teacher, but I don't, if I went back and taught those uh, age kids now, I teach them very differently from how I did when I taught them back in the 1970s last century. Um, but you know, I think the philosophy really was with a lot of maths teaching was that, you know, surely if I tell them all this stuff that eventually some of it will stick. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, so I, I, I think it's, that's not the way to teach mathematics is to hope that by more and more practice that they're going to get better. Um, and I think some of the UK research that I was talking about before with that anecdote about the volume, um, one of the outcomes of their research was that if kids don't understand the mathematics that they're practicing, they get worse, not better. And so you do, do need to understand what it is you're doing and then you can practice and then you'll improve. Um, so to me, it's about, OK, would be great if everybody knew their times tables, but you need to know what six sevens is um, in order to be able to then go ahead and just know that six sevens are 42. Um, so you get to that stage eventually, but if you uh, you do need to have some understanding before you do the practice, and then the practice hopefully ends up meaning that some some things become automatic. 
All right, so I've been crapping on for a while. Um, anybody got any? Th I'm, it's nice that I'm trying to also scan the, the comments in the chat as we're going. Uh, has anybody got any other particular questions? If you want to ask a question, please put your hand up and one of the ACR Aspire team will give you a hoy. Yeah, I like 42, answer to the life, yep, universe and everything. So Tim, I agree. I mean, it's to me, it's about learning and teaching. And, and I mean, I think, I mean, I just learned so much from my adult students because they questioned me, whereas my year seven, eight, nine kids, you know, if they didn't like maths or didn't understand maths, well, they misbehaved, they do other things, but it was very rare for kids in schools to say, come on, Dave, I don't understand that. Why does it work the way that it does? So, so they, my adult students made me think about how to teach mathematics from that understanding point of view um, and then have different strategies. I mean, I still believe that if you know your times tables, you're better off because you can just think in your head mm -hmm. and that mental um, ability does make things easier. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, so we got a couple more that got their hands up. I don't know if that's okay. maybe from last. Yeah, I can't see them. Yep. If you. Siobhan, the hand up, or is that just from last time? That's okay. <laughs> and John Shenton as well. But that could be from last time. All right, let's proceed. Pete, Pete, please put something in the chat and somebody else. Yeah. And so what, and, uh, okay. Okay. Um, so what I want to do here is take you back to one of the a, a, an easier calculation that was done when I was doing the asphalting work with um, Australian Asphalting um, Association. Um, and so one of the things that they had, one of the more simpler calculations that they had to do was when they were putting, filling in, you know, um, in the old way of putting in the loose asphalt um, and then had to compact it with a compactor or with a steamroller. So in, in a mythical job, Joe was out on the road and he had to, f knew that the depth of the hole or the road that had to be filled with asphalt was 225 millimetres deep. And that's what's called the compacted thickness. That is after the steamroller has gone over it and when it's done, it'll actually be at the right level and it'll have the right density for the, the traffic that's got to go over it. Um, so he knows that the loose thickness before it's compacted needs to be 20% more than the compacted thickness. Okay, so he's he's measured up to the curb or the edge that he knows that the asphalt's got to be up to from the bottom of where they've dug it out. So it's 225 millimetres deep. So obviously the question I'm going to ask you is, how high must the loose asphalt be prior to compacting by the roller? So you can throw a few numbers in the chat when you've worked that out. So the loose thickness needs to be 20% more than, so you have to add on 20% more to what the compacted thickness was. People are going to put in some other numbers or you're all going to agree with Salane. We've got a couple of different answers here. So the end, the end, well, I'll come back to the, the maths in a minute. Um, so obviously what you had to do, what you've been focusing on in, in the answer is uh, working out that 20% of the 225 and then you've got to add that on. Um, but the thing to me is that before you even did that, uh, you had to listen to what I was saying. That is that there were words on the screen, so I'd um, put them up on the screen, but I was also talking about it. And uh, as Sean was saying, you need to know that it's 1.2, so you've got to add that extra 20% on. Um, and so, but you were listening 
So what I want to know is in terms of when before, just before you started to do your calculations or think about which calculations and how you were going to do the 20% of the 225, um, what was helped you in make that decision? Hands up if it was just me talking it through um, or was it you, you reading the print or was it the diagram that I've got there? Was there was there anything that was how many people found that the diagram was something that actually enabled you to see that you had to add that 20% on on the top of the diagram? How many people was it just me talking? Was it oral was enough or was the diagram? Yeah. Yeah, so a few, yeah. So, so, so I guess the thing to me is that, you know, in terms of, you know, what we often think about in terms of mathematics is that we do focus on the, the fact that we have to know how to calculate the 20% of the 225 and add it on. Um, but that often in a, a real world context where we're using mathematics, um, that you also still have to understand uh, what it is you've got to do and it could be via a diagram, could be through a standard operating procedure or it could be that your mate or your boss, your supervisor is telling you what to do. So to me, you know, this the thing about how to solve a numeracy problem is, isn't is just about doing the maths and the sums, it's actually also about understanding what the words mean. So here you can see, and if somebody I think earlier was talking about the fact if you're working with an EAL, you know, somebody whose first language wasn't English, then of course the language is critical. So here, you know, you've got compacted thickness and loose thickness. So some of the terminology that use that we use isn't is an easy terminology either. So the language is difficult, and then you've also still got to decide what the mass is. So there's the combination to me. So now I want to know in the chat. So how did you calculate the twenty percent? So can somebody tell me just? type in, how did you work out the 20% of the 270? So some people are good maths people who multiply by 1.2, 10%, yep, 0.2. No, I don't believe some of you didn't do another thing. So Marita, so maybe it's Marita is the one I was looking for because often people will say, well, you know, 20% is double 10% and 10%, what do you do for 10%? You move the decimal point, you know, so, you know, so, so the really common thing is that, you know, with common percentages like 20%, 10%, you use that trick, if you like, of, you know, moving the decimal point. So 225, a tenth of that's 22.5, but it's 20%, double it. So that's where you get the, you know, the 45 from. Um, and so, um, so there's, you know, different, different ways of doing it, but I didn't see anybody divide by five. Did anybody divide by five? Because 20% is a fifth. Type in yes if you did the divide by five. Ah, thanks. Because it's quite common, you know, I think, you know, if I was thinking about it, I'd probably 20% to me is a fifth, so therefore fifths of 225 would be the way I get it. So you can see in, in doing a pretty everyday sort of problem like this, that even doing 20% <coughs> of uh, of a number can be done in different ways. And I noticed one person, I think, said that they did the 20 over 100 by 225 over one. Um, and, uh, and to me, uh, that creates a lot of problems. If you go back to what I call first principles, that is 20% means 20 over 100 and multiply by 2.25 over 1 and you start to cancel down, that's when you'll start making mistakes uh, and get the answer wrong. I mean, to me, a much more efficient method is to do the division by 5 or the division by 10 to 10% 10 and double. And often what we do, and in the training materials before I completely rewrote them, the existing training materials that they employed me to redo, the only way in that whole training manual to teach these young blokes 
um, how to do the 20%. Was that formal maths way as if we did it in school of 20 over 100 multiplied by 225 over 1? And when I asked the reference group, these you know supervisors and experienced dash felting people, I said, I have, would you work out the 20%? And they all said, oh, divide by 5, divide by 10 um, and double it and so on and so forth. So the, the training materials didn't actually reflect how people actually did it on the job. So it's really critical to make sure that I think when we are teaching numeracy and mathematics that we actually teach those, if you like, in the head on the back of the cigarette box ways of doing it rather than doing the formal maths way. So to me, solving a numeracy problem, an adult numeracy problem, the first step to me, which mirrors what's in the Australian Core Skills Framework, is the first thing you've got to do is understand what the problem is um, in the context. You need to interpret, read the world, listen and speak maybe, and get the maths out of the context. The second part is, sure, you've got to be able to do the maths. So you have to be able to work out the 20%. Um, and I don't care whether you really do it on your calculator, you use the fifth method, the 10% method or whatever. If you can get the answer, you can do the measurement, you can reason, you can use your tools, um, all those things. So sure, you still have to do mathematics. And then the third step is you've still got to go back to the real world and either record the answer, implement it, put the saw, put in this case the asphalt down. And if you've got 2,700 and you start to work out what 2,700 millimetres is, you think, oh shit, maybe I got the decimal point in the wrong place because that's a crazy height. So you do need to sort of put it back into the real world to make sure it's all, um, you know, making sense in the problem and be able to communicate it to your supervisor or your, your mate that you're working with. <coughs> so three steps I think are pretty critical and we've tried to imitate that in the ACSF. And so I guess what I, you know, in what I said I talk about, so it seems to me to be numerate you need to understand some mathematics, but you also under, need to understand the words that we use. So there is those elements to numeracy which incorporate literacy as well as mathematics. And like the words volume and odd, you need to understand the language of mathematics as well. So I want to go on now and spend a little bit of time looking at, I guess, more research type stuff that I've been privileged to sort of engage with over probably the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and so, you know, I guess I see numeracy as the bridge between mathematics and the real world. It's about making meaning of mathematics. Um, and I mean, I'm the chair of the numeracy expert group for the OECD's um, PX cycle, which is an assessment of adult competencies that the OECD um, runs that Australia participated in back in 2011. And we've defined numeracy as accessing, using and reasoning critically with mathematical content, information and ideas represented in multiple ways in order to engage in and manage the mathematical demands of a range of situations in adult life. But that's a very formal um, sort of way of defining it. And this is what adult numeracy is not. So I'll, I'll read it out to you, but I discovered this when I was working with a a uh, great friend and colleague um, from Sydney, Betty Johnson. We wrote a program called Adult Numeracy Teaching together. Um, um, and Betty uh, knew about this fable, so I'll read it out to you. Recently, I attended a carpentry course. It was pretty tough. All the students are almost all were eager to learn. The first three weeks, we learned to drill holes. We found out about curious kinds of drills and how to make holes at odd angles. We got pretty good and accurate at drilling holes. The next six weeks were involved in cutting wood. We used all kinds of saws, found out how they interacted with different kinds of wood and learned to cut accurately and smoothly. I got pretty good at cutting wood. The next four weeks we learned to plane wood. We used all kinds of planes on many different kinds of wood. I got pretty good at planing wood. Joints was a difficult course. It took eight weeks and we learned many kinds of joints. I was quite good at making joints. We did courses on other things too, sanding, turning, polishing, gluing and so on. Finally, we had an examination. We had to use all these skills. I did reasonably well and came fifth in the class. After the course ended, I went to see the director. I told him I quite liked the course in a way, though some of the students were turned off by it all. But really, I said, I took the course because I wanted to make it a table. He said that the top two or three went on to do things like that. I began to get mad. I said, 
What did we learn all that stuff for? He said, our course prepares people to make tables. His face got larger and larger. He began to fill the room. I got scared. Then I woke up. This was worrying. I discussed it with my colleagues. A psychiatrist took me back to my childhood, but no one could explain why a professor of mathematics should have a nightmare like that. Um, so it's a real, to me, that's a really nice, you know, take on, unfortunately, I think how we still teach mathematics in school classrooms. Um, and, uh, you know, we teach all these disjointed facts and they're not necessarily connected with how we actually might use maths out in the real world, but it's a really nice fable. So I thought I'd share it with you and you'll have access to the PowerPoint so you can share it with your friends and colleagues too and your kids if you've got kids like I did who hated maths at school. Um, one of the uh, research I like who's written some really good stuff is a guy called Lynn Steen. Uh, unfortunately, he died about three years ago. Uh, I was privileged to meet him. Um, and he wrote this, which is, uh, I think is a really <coughs> nice way of summing up what I see, I guess, is the difference between numeracy and mathematics. I now call myself a numeracy mathematics educator because I, I believe both numeracy and mathematics are both critical. What he said was that numeracy is not the same as mathematics, nor is it an alternative to mathematics. Today's students need both mathematics and numeracy, whereas mathematics asks students to rise above context. Quantitative literacy, which is often what they call it in the States, is anchored in real data that reflect engagement with life's diverse contexts and situations. It's a really nice statement of, um, I think, what numeracy is and what the difference is um, between numeracy and mathematics. But I think we need both. And I think we teach mathematics in schools. We don't actually, to a lot of students, teach numeracy, which is why when we get them in the VET system or in, an, in our adult LNN classes, we're actually teaching them numeracy and also as part of that, sometimes having to teach them the maths. Again, because I you know, write articles and collaborate with different people, this is a really nice model that uh, Marilyn Goose and Vince Skyger from up in Queensland, uh, Vince was in Melbourne for a while. Um, this is a really nice um, model of um, what I think, what they think is numeracy, underpinned by mathematical knowledge, but that it is about applying it in different contexts, so the personal, the citizen, the work, um, and you need dis good dispositions, confidence, flexibility, and initiative risk. You need to have tools. You need to be able to use physical tools, digital tools, and know how to represent mathematics. You need to be able to problem solve and estimate and have, have the right sort of understanding and skills. So a really nice diagram, I think, that shows how complicated numeracy is. I always say it's probably a hell of a lot easier to be a maths teacher than is a numeracy teacher um, because you've got to take all of that on board. I think we should do the same in maths teaching. So any other comments? Again, I've been talking for a long time. Anything, anybody got a question about any of that stuff? I'd just like to link us. Do you put an upper age limit to the notion of adult numeracy in Australia? Once you're overseeing this, there's three access to numeracy studies. No, I think there's a whole issue about access to free or supported or funded education. I think there's also big issues about um, teachers being funded to be trained as well. I think the last time in Victoria, we ran a substantial numeracy teacher training course was back when I ran adult numeracy teaching back in 2003 or 2004. And since then, the only opportunities have really been through attending conferences and stuff like that. All right, I'll keep going. So a little bit of research and people saying things, but all the research, I'll go through this quickly because I'm Probably going to run out of time knowing me. Um, so there's some quotes. I've got the references. So when you get the PowerPoint, you can follow this up. But basically, these slides are all showing you that anybody who's doing research about work and careers in the 21st century is saying that you need a whole range of different skills, but they're problem solving skills. And that people are now saying that you need science and math skills. And to me, that means we, we need people who um, are good at numeracy. And so 
you know, so I, I think all the research is indicating that as we move further into the 21st century, the need to engage with the world of mathematics and the world of stats and data is increasing, not decreasing. Um, there's a group from the UK who've sort of coined this phrase, techno-mathematical literacies, all, all based on research they've done mainly in manufacturing industries in the UK and Europe, but that it, the technology is also driving the need for people to understand mathematics even more than they did in the past. I'd say all of this is covered by numeracy, but then, you know. Um, one of the projects I worked on in, uh, I think it was around 2014, yep, I was, um, I get dragged out every now and then by the AAMT, which is the Australian Association of Maths Teachers. Um, I know people there, I do a bit of work in the secondary school maths um, um, area, and they dragged me out as the token vet person. So I, I got invited to be on the reference group for this research, which was um, conducted and about 12 or 13 maths teachers from secondary schools around Australia were paid to actually go and visit workplaces and have a look at what maths was being used in the workplaces and they published this report. And of course, all the maths people involved were pretty gobsmacked at this, but um, myself and Michael Taylor from the Australian Industry Group, who were both on the reference group, weren't surprised at all because we already knew it because we worked in vocational area. Um, but all of these, the 12 or 13 industries that they went into in different states across Australia, they all of the employers and the businesses all said that mathematics was considered to be extremely important to them and that this was changing as they move further into the 21st century because work practices were requiring a, a higher level of understanding of mathematics um, related to things like efficiency and innovation and quality control. And what they also said in this report and what the math teachers discovered was that it it wasn't just arithmetic that was needed, it was more sophisticated maths that was needed as well. Um, and that they performed quite sophisticated functions using those mathematical skills, and it was all embedded in problem solving. And I like this quote, which I use a lot. So one of the teachers observed and said in, in his written response was that this is one of the most interesting aspects, concepts of this project. The relationship between workplace mathematical skills and school mathematicals, school mathematics could be described as distant at best. Um, and so I think often our job in the vet sector is to is to also almost do that, is to, you know, let our students engage with this, you know, messy world of mathematics embedded in a workplace context um, and try and get them to connect the maths with the thing. But it's a nice Nice little research project that um, uh, probably most math teachers still ignore. Um, there's some research in the UK which basically said even those students who were good at science, technology, math, engineering, math at school, when they went out and worked in the sector, they still basically all of them, it was quite a high percentage, I think like 70 or something percent said that their, what they'd learned in school wasn't terribly helpful for them when they actually went out into the work. Well, into the work. So I quickly want to talk to you about one of the other projects I've been um, worked on, which is that um, really the I'll go through this quickly, but this is the this is the data. So this is the Australian results for this assessment of adults literacy and numeracy skills in Australia. This is the data from 2011, 12. And so these aren't the same levels as the ACSF. Um, so below level one, level one you can see that there's a lot more people at the lower levels in numeracy than there are in literacy. So these are the same adults. Um, and of course, the levels aren't necessarily comparable, but I'll show you an example of each of them in a minute. But basically, 44% of the population were below at level two or below in literacy compared to 54% in numeracy. And if you look at the gender difference, um, there were 10% more females were at the lowest levels compared to males, so there's also a significant gender difference. Um, this is the one of the interesting things when you work on these um, projects and you actually get to look at the results before the rest of the world do, um, was 
how was it going to be by age? And Australia did in the past. I'm not sure that they're doing it for the next round of PIAC. Um, oversample, so we include 15 year olds um, and we go up to 74 year olds, whereas internationally you only have to go from 16 to 64. So who are going to be the best performing group? So these are the percentages for the top level. So the ones with the, the better levels of skill. And so what happens as they get older, so from 15 to 19 year olds on average, you improve in your literacy and numeracy skills um, as you get into your 20s and you keep going up into your 30s. Then we plateau. And then as you get older, it's if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you're as old as I am, I'm in the last category. I'm hanging on with my fingernails and trying to not slip off the slippery pole. Um, but of course, this is, you know, all to do with age and education and and uh, it would, I always say it would be, will be interesting to see if this graph changes um, as, you know, we move forward um, as uh, older adults now of my age, for example, have been educated some um, more, but uh, so uh, literacy performance is better, numeracy levels are lower. Peak age is in your late 20s into your 30s, which isn't surprising in some ways. That's when you're using your skills out in the real world uh, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, some, I also worked on PISA. I didn't know I was going to work on PISA. PISA is the equivalent to PIAC, the adult survey. PISA is the big international survey of 15 year old kids around the world. Um, and in terms of Australia, you could, you could almost say Australia is not bad in literacy. That is um, in PIAC, we were fifth out of the 34 countries um, the last cycle and in PISA in reading literacy we were significantly above the mean and uh, and we're 16th out of 79 countries so you could sort of say okay Australia is not bad in literacy so the same adults the same 15 year old kids look at our relative performance in numeracy so these are the same kids same adults so in mathematical literacy you could say yeah we do okay but these same kids, these same adults are much lower in our performance in numeracy and mathematics. And so fifth in literacy in PIAC compared to 15th in uh, numeracy in PIAC. And in PISA, 16th and above the mean, whereas in PISA in numeracy, we're 29th out of those 79 countries. So to me, what that says is that relatively we do a pretty shit job on teaching mathematics compared to how we teach reading and literacy in Australia and it's not true in all countries obviously because you know countries aren't uh, and similarly the gender difference isn't true in all countries either so I think you know there's a lot of arguments to say numeracy is a challenge in Australia just to show you what those levels mean, this is an example of a below level one question in reading. So they had to be able to tell you, a circle on the on the answer or um, click on it, um, what was the maximum number of days you should take this medicine? So you actually had to, the word maximum doesn't exist in the text. So you had to match the, your understanding of the word maximum with not longer than. Um, so this is the lowest level in reading. So that's not a, from an ACS, <coughs> an ACSF perspective, that's certainly not a below level one text. And so there, so this PX survey, the, the, to me that's, you know, not a really, really simple text. Um, and uh, whereas that's a below level one, but in numeracy, that's a below level question. In fact, it's not Coca-Cola anymore. This is from the previous surveys. Um, it's now blank water, um, but basically it's a photograph of two packets of 24 um, bottles of water. And even if you couldn't read the question, you probably all know what the question was, which is how many bottles of Coke or water there. So it's pretty level, pretty low level. So that's more like a pre-level one question um, in terms of the ACSF. And so, but we still had over a million. So twi nearly twice as many Australian adults can't answer that question in, in numeracy, whereas they could answer that question. So, so, that, so to me, one of the things by knowing what the questions were, it seems to me that the bar is also set lower for numeracy. So although we perform, there's higher percentages at the bottom, I also don't think the bar's as high. 
So I think we have a problem with numeracy mathematics in Australia that needs to be addressed. And the OECD put out a country report based on um, PIAC and PISA data published in 2017. And you can see out of there, one, two, three, four, five, six conclusions or recommendations. Numeracy gets mentioned in three of them as being a significant problem in Australia. And in relationship to two of them, um, women is also one of the things that they've highlighted. So it seems to me that, you know, we really have a challenge in Australia in this area of numeracy, which is why I believe that we should never forget the N and L and N, it's really critical. And there's UK research that shows the same stuff that for women in particular, having low levels of numeracy has a bigger impact than it does on having just low levels of literacy. So there's a lot of research to now show that numeracy is really critical. I'm going to keep going and ask you some questions and I'm going to miss that one um, because I want to get on to the tips. Um, you can read this later. So I want to get on to the tips for the last five or six minutes before I uh, open up to questions. So one of my first tips, as I say, and we we sort of do it naturally in adult L and N um, and uh, uh, and in the vet sector. So connect maths to the real world, start with the real world, don't start with the sums. To me, the context provides the meaning um, and we need to teach how to get the maths out of the context, which has those literacy aspects. So that's really critical to support learners to be able to do that. And the second one is that I think that you need to make connections between all of the different bits of the ACS. So don't forget about the reading, the speaking, the listening and the talking about numeracy. Numeracy isn't just maths, facts and rote learning. It's understanding how and why the maths works and applying it is critical. Um, and do this in different ways. Get students to be able to do maths in different ways. Share, talk to each other about how they do things. Can you do it in your head? Can you do it on paper? And of course, can you use your calculator or a tool or an app? Um, and to me, don't forget language and literacy are critical. And sometimes you might find that the, if you like, the, the, the thing that's blocking some adult students from learning mathematics is simply that they don't understand the words and actually talking to them about the words is often enough to enable them to move forward. And I guess one of the things if people ever ask me how I would teach maths differently if I went back into secondary schools, I would much be much more proactive about getting students to work um, in small groups so that they work together on solving problems so that they can share and talk and explain to each other rather than listening to me tell them how to do it. And I guess the other thing that, you know, I think is really critical in a workplace situation <coughs> is you need to have a feeling for maths about being able to do those in the head things and estimate. Um, so questions like, does this answer make sense? Do I have enough money to buy these items? Will I have enough time to make this? Will this fit? About how big is this? A bit like that, the caffeine example at the start. It's about what does 0.3 grams look like compared to 30 grams? And this is an, this happened in one of my visits to Tassie and one of the trade teachers at the TAFE that I was doing the workshop in, he had just come from a recent experience where he was working with his, uh, his guys and they were laying, he was getting them to lay a, and prepare and lay a concrete slab for a, a small um, toilet or something or other. So I can't remember the context that he said, but something like the one on the left, which I think it'd be about 0.75 of a cubic metre. Um, and this uh, student came up with the answer of, um, you know, 75 or something or other cubic metres. And so the, the, the trade teacher was really good. He said, oh, that's a really interesting. And do you think that's right? And the kid said, oh, yeah, look, I've done on my calculator at 75 or something. Else. And so the teacher said, well, you know, how how many, you know, cement mixes does that mean you're going to get when you order 75 cubic metres of, of concrete? And the kid said, oh, oh, yeah. And, and so they had this discussion about that the concrete mixer held about, you know, five cubic metres of um of concrete and therefore he'd end up having 15 cement mixer trucks out the front wanting to lay this little slab of concrete. So that ability to think about was that the answer makes the sense, um, uh, you know, 
is a really critical skill is to be able to sort of think about what your answer is and whether it fits the context. Just as a one last little activity before I open up for questions and um, so this is an activity that I've been taking carrying with me ever since I was teaching students and I I imitated this and if people want a copy it's a word document you can change the date so I changed this last week when I was preparing this to be in 2021 so for imitation um, food labels from like the deli and uh, so can you just put into the chat uh, what's some easy questions you could ask based based on those four imitation um, barcodes um, what's a more challenging question so just fire away in the chat <coughs> what could you ask students to do with those and the idea is you cut them up and have them on cards <coughs> so they can manipulate them and put them in order or whatever so what could you ask so we've got Sharon says what is the total price of these four items think of something a bit different Total weight, total cost, which is the cheapest per kilo. Yep, great. How much change? Yep. Aha, uh -huh. how many days have you left to use this item? Cool. What is the latest date you can cook a meal using these four? Yeah, used by dates. Which item is the lightest? How did they calculate the total price? Yep. Yep, yeah, okay. What happens if they were half price? What's the best value? So what are some more chat? Anybody want to throw in some? What could you do with this that might be a little bit more challenging? Move it up to maybe ACSF level, you know, three even. Yeah, price per 100 gram. I always say, you know, if you're going to make pizza with these, you know, how much would you need? So they'd have to actually do a bit of research and you could they discounts like if it's the last day, you know, you might sell them off for a certain um, price. So I mean, so all it's quite simple, but it seems to me it's something that's every day um, for low level learners. You might want to make sure that they know what net what could mean. So I mean, you know, so you actually have words in there that you might need to work out about. I always say, you know, if you actually just bought the Ollies for $8.13, how much would you actually pay if you um, paid with cash? Because of course we don't have one cent um, pieces and all that. So, and about how much would you pay by rounding off? So there's lots of questions, but something really simple. So I, I think, and to me, you can do that with a whole pile of different contexts. So you could do it the same with cars. You could basically get a couple of, um, bits of information about engine capacity, fuel consumption, about different costs, you know, different things about cars, put them on a card and get students to sort them by different aspects or ask them different questions. So I think it's make it simple and then you can ask some quite good, um, uh, you know, questions based around it. So there's some lists of things you can look at later. The FSK has 40 something units of numeracy, which of course you can have access to. There's more than there were before. Um, that's also a something that you can use. And what I'll do is um, I'll, I have a list of numeracy resources that I try and keep up to date, but of course links um, tend to uh, die or change very quickly, but hopefully they're relatively up to date. So I'll send you my list of numeracy resources as well and Aspire has some numeracy materials as well that you can have a look at. So you've uh, suffered me for nearly an hour and a half. So any burning questions? Um, Billy, was there anything I missed from earlier? You, I saw you make a comment about. Um, <clears throat> let me go back. There was. Uh, or anybody who did have a question, do you want to quickly ask it now? There was a question here from Patrick Chamberlain. Have you found a useful, good way to teach digital numeracy? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it seems to me that digital 
these days means that you're engaging with it in a different format, not print. Um, I think one of the things about digital stuff in the 21st century is that we seem to be bombarded with more and more data. So it seems to me that, that one of the real, the skills that we've probably got to address now is how you actually interact with big data um, and the sort of data that's collected about people and on our, on our, on, on your phones and in social media and everything. So, so to me, one of the, one of the critical things with digital things is is just the amount of data that we're bombarded with and being able to engage with that. And people can press buttons and create amazing graphs, but do they know what they're creating and can we interpret it? Um, so yeah, not sure I've answered your question, but uh, I still think I actually believe that the best way to teach maths is still with hands-on materials. So I'm still very passionate about getting in a physical space with learners so that they can actually play with things like those barcodes. Um, anyone has I any like questions it. and they I want like to raise it, um, I like things, uh, raise it in the, not in the chat, you can raise it live if you want to ask Dave anything. I like Alenka's one about numbers may be rational, but teaching numeracy is not. Yes, <laughs> certainly challenging, but fun. Here we go, here's one. Uh, Tim asks, is there research to show links between low numeracy and money management? I'm not a, not aware of explicit research. I, I mean, I think my my answer would be that, you know, if you teach numeracy well, then a consequence would be that you would be better at handling money because it seems to me one of the common contexts that we engage with in teaching numeracy is is money and the cost of things and the cost of products and even in a workplace about costing doing a job and all that sort of stuff. So it seems to me one of the issues with financial literacy, which they often call it, is that I think we forget about the maths aspect. I'd, I'd much rather call it financial numeracy, but literacy is, is much sexier and so things get called literacy rather than numeracy. Um, so I think we should have called it financial numeracy so that we're actually connecting it more strongly with the world of mathematics. I think that's it. If anyone has any other questions after the webinar, please feel free to email them through to me um, and I can get them over to Dave and we can um, have them answered for you definitely. Yeah, thank you folks. Sorry I had to skip a few slides, but you can read them at your leisure when you get the copy of the PowerPoint and you will get a copy of the recording as well. Yep. And we have got one more webinar if anybody wants to suffer me next week, but it's really yep. targeted at VET people who don't know much about the Australian Course Skills Framework or LNN, so it's a bit of a beginner's um, session, but that's on next week. And then we've got a couple planned for September as well. One about how to write multiple choice test questions, because I've done that over many years at ACR and people are really critical of multiple choice questions, but I think they serve a purpose. Anyway, thanks folks for uh, listening to me and I hope it was uh, interesting and you weren't bored for 90 minutes but um please as billy said get back to us with any questions and we can um, send you out some further information and i'll send you out some information or billy will over the next probably by hopefully by the end of tomorrow with a link to the recording of the um webinar so thank you and good luck and it's important work to work in the area of numeracy it really does count in people's lives thank you very much Thank you. See you, folks. Thank you.